Hi, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk About Series. This one involves cybersecurity essentials and the art of protecting secrets. In this chapter, we will be covering uh, cryptography, access controls, and obscuring data. These are three very important ways of protecting your data, encrypting it, who can see it, and how to protect it from being seen. Cryptography. Cryptography has been around for a long time. It's where they use algorithms to change the coding, or when you get a message, they may replace the A with a B, or a, or like a number with the, uh, I guess a letter. And you probably do that with your current um, passwords now. Uh, there are different methods called ciphers to encrypt and decrypt messages, uh, and they're also well known throughout the industry. And they're used clear back in the uh, the days of when they had kings and courts. There are two types of encryption. One is asymmetric algorithms and one is asymmetric algorithms. The easiest way to remember this is the symmetric algorithms use the same pair of secret keys for both ends of the data, whereas the asymmetrics use a different key on both sides. Symmetrics is uh, faster, can handle more data, but less secure. Asymmetrics, smaller amount of data, actually more secure just because it receives different keys on both sides uh, when it's sent. Uh, symmetrics encryption, you've probably seen these before. Uh, 3DSC, it uses 64-bit blocks and 56-bit encryption, not as safe as before. IDEA, International Data Encryption Algorithm, this also uses 64-bit to 128-bit keys. and AES, which you've probably seen a lot, and this one's 128, 192, and 256 encryption. And this one is used by the standard of the National Institute of Standards and Technologies. Um, and, and if you look, it was actually developed clear back in 2001, which is quite a ways back. So that just shows you the strength of it. Asymmetric encapsulation is RSA or uh, Rivers Shamar. Adelman, pardon if I have a problem pronouncing that, and it's between 100 and 200 digits that uses it. Uh, and we ha then we have Diffie-Hellman. Uh, this is used by, I believe, the routing protocol uh, OSPF, I believe, uses that. It's also used for secure socket layer, transport, secure layer, and secure shell, and also IPsec. It's uh, probably the most common one used out there. And then we have IE uh, Gamma and Elip Curve Cryptographism. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a hard time reading these things. Anyways, these are the standards used by asymmetric type things within the government and also private industry. As you notice, these are probably the most common ones you've seen a secure socket shell and secure socket layer that you use now and currently, and also IPsec. When you compare the two, uh, asymmetric encryption is a, a more efficient and can handle more data. How, however, key management of symmetric encryption data is more problematic and harder to manage, whereas asymmetric data is more efficient to protecting the confidentiality of small amount of data, and its size and speed makes it actually more secure tasks for electronic exchange. So if you have more crucial data that you want protected, you want to use asymmetric. Just to get it through there, most companies use symmetric, which I don't agree with, but that's just the way it is at the moment. Applications that can use these, uh, when you do electronic payments, like in a bank, they use uh, 3DSC. Operating systems use DSC, which is what you use whenever you encrypt your uh, files on your PC, and then most encryptions are also NTFS um, uses encryption that a lot of people don't realize that it uses AES. And, and remember from the previous slides that these are the types of encryption used in industry. So that's why you kind of always see these acronyms within the industry or when you're reading about encryption or security. Here are some of the protocols used for asymmetricals. Internet Key Exchange or Ike. It's used as a fundamental component of IPvSec or VPNs, and that's what a lot of people use. Secure socket layer when you're doing 
uh, connecting to web pages, web browsers, and then a secure shell when you're cr uh, going back and forth. Remember, if you're transferring data, you never want to use Telnet. Always use the uh, secure shell. Telnet will always transfer your information in clear text, which means anybody can intercept it and read it. Whereas uh, secure shells is uh, encrypts it from point A to point B. And then, of course, this is pretty good privacy, and I did not make this up, which is a computer program that provides cryptography, privacy, and authentication data through email. So if you ever see PGP, it's pretty good privacy, and that is what it was named. Applications for VPNs. Uh, VPNs use IPsec. It's a suit of protocols that were developed. IPsec allows for authentication, integrate integrity, access control, and confidentiality. It can be used on remote sites to exchange information and it, it is used by quite a bit of companies. If criminals compromise data, they will have to have the key, access to the data at the rest of the data in motion, which means they have to wait for the whole thing to show up before they can do anything with it. And if they get cut off or whatever, uh, then they will lose the current data they have. Okay, let's talk about access controls. Okay, you have the, uh, the different kind of access controls. You have uh, the physical access controls, the logical, and the administrative. Uh, the physical is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it's going to be physical control when you go to. Have you ever noticed whenever you walk into organizations such as banks, there are always two doors coming in, two doors going out? That is so if anything happens, they can lock the person between the two doors or get that extra protection of the second door. Uh, down here on the logical is where you would actually do hardware software base. Uh, you would use protocols, uh, computer tools to, uh, to do identification, authentication, and accountability. And then of course your access controls are going to be at your, uh, at your like administration level where they make policies and procedures that define what is illegal when you do something like download code that you should not have or that stuff. Thing. A huge build up, a hu huge build up in the industry is going to be administrative control. Uh, companies need to have very good policies in place and procedures. Otherwise, if something occurs, they may not have any recourse to do anything against it because there is no policy or procedure for that. So that's why you you will see those in more and more degrees as you go out into the real world, and more and more companies will begin to, I guess, uh, begin to like adapt these new changes. On the access controls, you have uh, the, uh, the max, which are the mandatory access controls. These are the ones that you have to be who you are and what you do. The discretionary access controls are DAX, are granted, and they are based on the objective of the owner. So if you are part of a group, you can do it. RBACs are role-based access controls. These are if everybody's in accounting and somebody leaves, somebody in accounting can take the role of the other person within the same accounting area because they are in the same role and they are in the same role based. And the rule based is you. these are the rules that follow. If you are not doing this or you, if you do not have this clearance, the rule will block you from accessing. Uh, so mandatories have to, if it's in the owner's area, if they're in the role of what they're doing or what they are working on. and the rule or the uh, what has to be done would be the rule based. Identification uh, they are required from system resources they can re they can access the controls to determine whether they get access or not. Uh, cybersecurity policies like I mentioned before they identify the controls that can be used. Uh, the sensitivity of the information this is where security clearances would come involved and of course, increase in data breaches have forced many organizations to strengthen controls, which means nowadays you will have a, a, a dual uh, authentication, which means you have to have a number or some physical aspect of yourself, whether it be fingerprint, eyeball, to get into an organization now. And here's exactly what I was talking about. What you know, password, paraphrases, pins, what you have, smart card, fobs, or anything of that nature. Who you are, uh, your physical characteristics, fingerprints, retina, and uh, multi-factor authentication will use at least two of these type of things where 
just because you have somebody's password you might not have their smart card or you might have their pin but you don't have their fingerprint so this is where the person theoretically has to be there to get the authentication done to get into a system such as an ATM bank or government or educational system authorization authorization is pretty much just the control and what they cannot and can do within a network this is where policies and procedures come into place are you authorized to be looking at bank records are you authorized to be looking at student records can you edit the student records beyond just seeing them uh, the list goes on and on it's just uh, the first step in controlling access is what can individuals see do and change or not see or not do or not change if you give the uh, the rights to an incorrect person they may I'll be a threat to your organization, so be very careful on when you're defining authorization rules to individuals within your organization. Accountability is how can an organization be accountable for what happens? If something happens, if some information is stolen, do they have auditing in place or billing in place? Do they have when users' accounts are logged in? Can they track? A suspicious activity like this employee only works from 8 to 5 but yet they were logging in at 9 at night that's an out of place um, procedure also, also they only work Monday through Friday but yet they're logging in on weekends that's another suspicious place or they are using different devices that they they, they would not be doing on uh, then again here's where policies and procedures and education comes into place Pay attention to more than just user accounts, but when are they doing it, and is it out of place for them to be doing it at that time or during the time that they would be to lunch or on vacation even. That's when a lot of people do that. Types of security are preventative controls. These happen to stop unwanted and unauthorized activity. Uh, deterrence, this is what, um, you know, give an award or have people pay more attention to what they're doing. These don't always start deterrence would be like uh, extra security at the doors, extra cameras in the system, and of course uh, a detective controls. Uh, these act as uh, dis uh, you know for discovering something, identification, and authorized activity like I mentioned before. This is when you're doing something that is out of sync with what your hours are or what you would normally be doing this is when you would be paying attention to unauthorized building access, unauthorized uh, code access, unauthorized whatever. So these three things you need to pay attention to when uh, securing your organization. Corrective controls. What do you do if something happens? How do you correct it? How do you make sure it doesn't happen again? Recovery controls. How do you recover the information? How do you get it back to normal states? And then uh, compensative controls. How, what do you do to make it to where it will not happen again, enforce the supportive security policies. Uh, you want to make sure that it is not going to happen under any circumstance again. Uh, here again, these three things are when it happens, how to prevent it, and how to keep it from happening. These are three things that you need to put in policy and procedures to, to cover anything that may occur. And even something out of the blue, put it in there because you need to cover your organization and yourself. Obscuring data. This is a big one. Obscuring data. You can do different things in obscuring data. You can replace the sensitive information with non-sensitive information. Send it out and make sure it goes through with no issues. You can do sh uh, substituting or shuffling of the information to make it look different. Uh, a, a lot of times companies will actually send out information that's false to make sure that the connection from point A to point B is valid and true. And then if it is if, and then if it is intercepted, then they can figure out how it was done, and uh, there is no loss of critical assets. Stenography is another big thing. This is where, and I do these in my networking security courses, where you can take images, audio files, and you can embed stuff inside of them, such as secret messages, word documents. Uh, images and those types of things. So a lot of companies don't scan for technography, which they should because a lot of pictures can hide uh, graphics, text, anything inside of it. 
And because they're a JPEG, GIF, or whatever, typically they will go right through scanners because they are not looking for hidden things within a, within a picture or within an MP4 or JPEG or those types of things. Be very careful of that. Uh, okay, this is actually a, a call it data obstruction. I have a hard time pronouncing this word, forgive me. This is where you make it confusing, ambiguous, and hard to understand. Uh, you can put watermarks on it. A lot of companies do watermarks, so if you do use their software, they will know because a watermark is built into the software. Uh, a lot of companies will do this free, then if you try using their stuff without paying for it and put it on the web or p publish it, they know you didn't purchase it correctly or it's fake. Sometimes people try to remove the, uh, the watermark and this will be non-functional, it will make the code not work. So that's why more and more companies now will give you free trials of the software, but it will prevent you from using it beyond the 30 days or 90 days. Or if you do use it, the watermark is stuck on there and that just shows other people watching it, hey, these people are using this free software without paying for it. <laughs> or that's how I look at it at least. Okay, I know that was a pretty quick overview, but this chapter here is pretty much self-explanatory. Basically, just uh, be careful of what you're doing, pay attention, and watch my screen as PowerPoint is trying to restart itself. <laughs> and now it's restarting, and I should get it back here in a minute. That just shows you that computers are like anything else. They, they will crash on you, they will break on you, and we will do this because this is something we need to cover. Okay, back where I was, after my PowerPoint crashed, this is the chapter that covers access control. All this chapter basically means is be careful of what you do, what you send, how you send it. Um, know your organization's codes, how they send it, Keep track of obscure times when people check in, log in, building, physical, or uh, computer-based. And be careful of hidden surprises such as technography. And make your items harder to read or not understand as easily as need be. I know that there's a lot to this, but uh, please hang in there. And as we go through, we will cover more and more aspects of um, actually... Uh, controlling data and securing data on your network and your computer's company network. Thank you.